So we've seen Descartes where he takes a, a look at how we come to know things and he gives, uh, you know, possibilities, alternate possibilities for the sources of our information and from that uh, he says, you know, we really don't know uh, what's going on around us. Hume's a little bit different than Descartes. Hume uh, takes seriously the ideas that uh, our sensory information just is caused by the outside world. He doesn't really question that a whole lot. However, uh, he takes a hard look at how uh, we come to know about the outside world or about the external world and how we come to know the world, period. And he wonders whether we actually know as much as we think we know. But he does it not through these bizarre scenarios in which we're brains and vats or evil geniuses or something like this. Uh, instead, he just takes a look at what we actually can do and wonders whether we could do much with that. So the first thing that Hume takes a look at is the kinds of things that we can know, or what he calls the objects of knowledge. And uh, there's two main objects of knowledge. Uh, we'll deal with the first first. <laughs> the first is called relations of ideas. Right. Now the relations of ideas would be that knowledge that we have uh, that we derive simply from the meanings of terms, simply from the meanings of concepts. So arithmetic, geometry, even logic falls into this category. Uh, so, uh, numbers are purely conceptual matters. We don't ever observe the number one out here, right? I can take this camera and film around all day out here and I never get the number one. Right? Uh, I'd get plenty of trees, I'd get blue sky, I'd get path, that sort of thing. And I might even be able to count the trees, but uh, how I count the trees is itself not the concept. That's me using the concept and that's a difference. So I, I'd never be able to film the number one out here. Uh, this is simply what we know without observation. Right? Uh, what also what Hume calls a priori. Right? A priori. Um, so this is knowledge that we have independent of any kind of observation. Numbers, right? So 2 plus 2 equals 4. 4 plus 4 equals 8. Uh, the sum of any, two num of any two odd numbers is an even number. Um, the... Uh, 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 the, uh, 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 if you equally, uh, if you divide an even number into two equal parts, they'll always be even numbers. Right? Th these are, uh, um, these are the products of knowledge uh, through uh, relations of ideas. Right? That a square has four equal sides. That the interior angles of a square equal uh, 360 degrees. I think, yeah, 360 degrees. <laughs> Trying to recall my eighth grade geometry here. Right? This is all knowledge. Uh, that we have simply through relations of ideas. The truth relations that I taught you in class, uh, sufficient, necessary, contrary, subcontrary, those are the four possibilities and those combine to give you the complex truth relations. So that, you know, equivalent just is uh, a proposition that is sufficient and necessary for another proposition. And we can keep going on with the examples here. Now what's important about these, uh, about, the, about the relations of ideas is that we use demonstrative reasoning to reach conclusions using relations of ideas. Demonstrative reasoning is pretty much like I talked about in class how I describe deductive reason. Demonstrative reason is such that if the premises are true, the conclusion must be true. Now we can give a demonstration using the meanings of the terms for these conclusions. So we have uh, relations of ideas and relations of ideas use demonstrative reasoning. Now an interesting thing about demonstrative reasoning is uh, any conclusion using demonstrative reasoning uh, is, n is, in a sense, necessarily true, meaning, or absolutely true, using the truth relations that we talked about in class. Meaning that if you take the conclusion and deny it, it results in a self-contradiction. So, if I, you know, I have my, I have my, uh, I have my definition of square for uh, a, a equilateral, equilateral, excuse me, equilateral, equiangular, quadrilateral, that's my definition of square, using demonstrative reasoning, I conclude that the interior angles of a square equal three, that the sum of the interior angles of a square equal 360 degrees. If I deny that, if I say it is false that the sum of the interior angles of a square equals 360 degrees, it results in a contradiction. Um, simply because of the meaning of what it means to be square. Uh, if I say it is false that 2 plus 2 equals 4, that results in a contradiction. 
And if I have two, addition, equality, and four, I put all of it together and using demonstrative reasoning, I, I conclude that two plus equals four. If I try to say that's false, that results in a self-contradiction. So this is what's interesting about the relations of ideas using demonstrative reasoning, is that the conclusion, if denied, results in a self-contradiction. Or another way of saying that is, it's the conclusions of demonstrative reasoning cannot be false. Cannot be false. So this is the first kind of object of knowledge, is knowledge using relations of ideas. And it uses demonstrative reasoning, and its conclusions cannot be false. The second kind of object of knowledge that Hume gives us is called, or what he calls matters of fact. Now, uh, matters of fact uh, are different from uh, uh, relations of ideas because matter of facts are, for, instance, for example, things that, uh, uh, you know, conclusions using matters of fact uh, can be false. All right, so right now I, I say there are cedar trees in Friedrich Wilderness Park. Right? And I, I know this by looking out and spotting one. Right? Yeah, there's a cedar tree right there. But its denial can be false. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, it's denial can be true, excuse me, it's denial can be true. Uh, it could have been the case that Friedrich Wilderness Park didn't have any cedar trees. Uh, the uh, matters of fact are what we're going to know by observation. What we're going to know by observation. Uh, so this is different than uh, relations of ideas. Uh, the conclusions using matters of, re uh, matters of fact can be false. And we do this all the time, right? We have all kinds of conclusions using matters of fact. Not all of them are false, right? But they could be. Right? So you're a student at San Antonio College. That could be false. It just happens to be true. It's, it, as a matter of fact, it is true. But it could have been false. Right. You could have been a student at UTSA or uh, Harvard or Yale or, or whatever. Um, so uh, our reasoning using matters of fact is what uh, Hume calls moral reasoning. Now, it's not, I don't think, it's not moral reason in the sense that these are conclusions about uh, how we are to live our life. Rather, I think he's meaning something like moral as in habitual kinds of reasoning. So uh, these are the two kinds of objects of knowledge. We have... Uh, matters of fact, and we have relations of ideas. Relations of ideas use demonstrative reasoning, and the denials, uh, excuse me, the, the uh, conclusions using demonstrative reasoning must be true. Their denials cannot be true. Then we have matters of fact. Matter of fact uses moral reasoning. This is basically knowledge that we get uh, through observation, right? Through observation. Uh, the conclusions using moral reasoning uh, can be false. They're, they're in fact not false. One hopes, <laughs> but they can be false. So, we have our two kinds of reasoning, demonstrative reasoning and moral reasoning. Now, we can have plenty of knowledge claims. I mean, Hume's willing to take seriously the idea that we get plenty of knowledge claims simply by observation. Right? So, I observe there are trees. I observe there is a path. I observe there are stones lining the path. I observe it is daytime. Now, these observations, well, you know, they're fine, right? There's nothing wrong with them, uh, are kind of limited. Right? Uh, these are actually not the product of reasoning at all. So a product of moral reasoning, using this observation, is something like this. I observe there's a path here. I conclude, using moral reasoning, that somebody made the path. It's a really reasonable inference. We're, we're familiar with this all the time. I mean, we look at the path. It doesn't look like a natural formation. We're used to the idea of people coming in and building things in nature, especially parks, like what I'm in now. Okay? So I, I infer, using moral reasoning, that somebody built that path. And I make that inference based upon experiences. And I also make that inference based upon uh, cause and effect. Cause and effect. So I, I look at the path and I infer it has a cause. And I infer that that cause is people. Somebody built that path. Uh, I look around at the trees here. 
I, you know, I know some things about trees. I have uh, some more reasoning about trees. I look at these trees and I, and I know, using more reasoning, that these trees produce oxygen. You know, they process carbon monoxide, I think it's monoxide, they process carbon monoxide into oxygen. That's one of the reasons why I can still breathe on this planet is because of these trees. So, uh, that's also the product of moral reasoning. And that product of moral reasoning, again, relies upon what I know from cause and effect. That's what I know from cause and effect. Well, how do we go about this knowledge of cause and effect? Well, here's something, right? We can't intuit cause and effect. I can't just simply look at this rock, look at this rock, and then I know where it comes from. Is that even in focus? I, don't, I can't simply look at this rock and know where it comes from. Right? I don't know much about rocks. And it's got some coloration there. And if you can see this coloration, it's got some edges. Right? Uh, it's got some coloration here. It's even got, you know, to my eyes, looks like Maybe some kind of vein in there. I, I don't know. I don't know anything about rocks. Here's, here's another rock, right? And it's got different colors. And, and here's another rock, right? So I look at these rocks. I don't know anything about rocks. I can't just simply look at this rock and tell you what kind it is and where it's from and how it was formed, what its chemical composition is. I can't even tell you. I mean, this one might be man-made because it's got that kind of crusty feature to it. Maybe it's breaking off from a piece of concrete. And I'm guessing this one is not man-made because it's got the smooth edges and, and some of the sharp edges there as well. But I don't know. I'm just making guesses, really, from my limited uh, knowledge of observations and my limited knowledge of cause and effect about this rock. So if we know anything by, uh, about cause and effect of this rock, it's not intuited. It's not going to be the product of re a relation of idea. I don't have a concept of rock embedded such that uh, its denial is false. So I can say this rock is from granite. This rock came from a large granite volcano. I don't I'll just make his stuff up. But that, that conclusion can be false. So it's not the product of an idea, a relation idea. It's not a product of demonstrative reasoning about this rock. So it has to be moral reasoning. And that moral reasoning relies upon cause and effect. And the only way I can know cause and effect is through observation. Right? Because you've got your two sources. Either through relations of ideas or through matters of fact. Relations of ideas can't handle it. It's got to be relations uh, of matters of fact, and that's through observation. Okay, well, fine. You know, I, I learn about cause and effect through matters of fact, through observation. So here's, you know, I'm observing, right? I'm knowing something about this rock by observation. I know that when I throw it in the air, it comes back down. And I know this through repeated observations. I keep watching it and bring it down. No problem. Well, here's where Hume comes in. He says, okay, you toss that in the air about a dozen or so times, right? Yeah, sure, I toss it in the air about a dozen or so times. So, you know by observation that you've thrown it in the air about a dozen times and you caught it. You, know, you throw in the air, it comes up, and it comes back down, and you caught it. That's what you observed. And I say, yeah, that's what I observed. I, I threw it in the air, I saw it go up, I saw it come back down, and I caught it. So Hume says, okay, so you throw it in the air 13th time. You're going to throw it in the air the 13th time. Is it going to come back down? And I say, yeah, it's, it's going to come back down. That's, that's what I observed. It goes up and it comes back down. Hume says, you observed it going up. Uh, 12 times and uh, coming down 12 times. You didn't observe a 13th time. So yeah, you know, I didn't observe the 13th time, but I observed the 12. That's, that's enough. Hume says, well, where's the observation for the 13th time? I say, well, I'll do it right now. 13. And Hume says, yeah, now you observed the 13th time. But you didn't observe it yet. So what are you saying, Hume? He's saying I didn't know? Uh, that it was going to come back down. I mean, I saw it go up and down. I saw it go up 
and every time I saw it go up, I saw it come back down. That's correlation. I'm going to throw it up and it comes back down. That's correlation. Every time I throw it up, that's correlated with it coming back down. I saw that 12 times. Why wouldn't it come back down the 13th time? Hume says, I don't know why it wouldn't come back down the 13th time. I didn't observe it. If you're drawing that knowledge only from observation, you didn't observe that 13th time. And so you don't know until you observe it. So what are you saying, Hume? I don't have any knowledge from observation? Hume says, no, of course you have knowledge of observation, but it's limited to the observations. You don't observe that 13th time. And I say, well, Hume, come on. I, I saw it go up 12 times. I saw it come back down 12 times. I did it the 13th time. My prediction was right. So I know that the 12th time, you know, so I know that this throwing it up causes it to come back down. I know that that's causation. Hume says, I didn't see a sign that says causation. I didn't see a magical glowing force called causation. All I saw was correlation. Go ahead, throw it again. See if a little sign called causation pops up. Okay, Hume, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. There's no sign that time, but maybe it'll pop up this time. No, there's no sign that time. Hey, there was a sign. Hume says, you're cheating. <laughs> so this is Hume's point. If you're relying just upon observation, you don't see causation. All you see is the rock going up and the rock coming down. You don't see it going up and down in the future, right? So you don't know anything by observation about those future events. So you don't really have anything yet by causation. You don't know anything by causation. All you have is observation. Now, you know, Hume is right that, you know, at most what you have is correlation with these events. And there's all kinds of reason to suggest that correlation is not causation. Uh, if you go to a website called Spurious uh, Correlation, they'll show you as a 99% correlation between uh, increase in U.S. spending in science, technology, and space, and the number of suicides by strangulation, uh, uh, by strangulation and suffocation. It's just simply false that U.S. spending causes people to kill themselves uh, by strangulation. They have another correlation between <laughs> per capita consumption of cheese and the number of people who have died in their beds by getting tangled up in the sheets. There's a really there's a 95% correlation between per capita <laughs> increase in consumption of cheese and the number of people who uh, die in their beds by getting tangled in the sheets. Correlation is not causation. Not necessarily. I mean, it's a nice sign. We use that in the physical sciences all the time, but it's not enough to show causation. So this is Hume's point. Right? We never observe causation. At most, what we observe is correlation. Now the question is, does that correlation allow us to make, you know, are we justified in our predictions about the future? All right, so I've tossed the rock. That's what, 15 times now? Right? 16 times, 17 times, and it comes back down. Does that mean I'm justified in saying, well, forget about causation at this point, just is that, am I justified in saying that the 25th time I toss the rock in the air is going to come back down? All right, or every time I toss the rock in the air is going to come back down. Am I justified in saying that? Well, I'm starting to think Hume is nuts because I keep throwing this rock and it keeps coming back down. I don't always catch it, <laughs> but it keeps coming back down, right? So, I don't know, Hume, come on, man. What's wrong with this observation and or correlation and saying that it's, it's going to come back down? I mean, maybe, okay, maybe, maybe, maybe. I'm not always going to get... Uh, maybe I won't be able to infer causation because I can't observe causation. But I bet I can make a lot of observations and I can still do something you know, with, with lots of knowledge about matters of fact using more reasoning about how the world's going to work. Right? We do it all the time. Right? It's called the physical sciences. And we, just, we just do it. So we, you know, we have that. It goes up. 
it comes back down. Right? I've done this. I've done this. It goes up. Comes back down. Well, what's going on here? Well, remember, what Hume is trying to show us. He's trying to show us that there are limits to our knowledge. All right. Now, in order for me to always know that this is going to come back down, right? I have to be able to use my observations and infer something about what has happened to what will happen. What has happened to what will happen. And this is called the principle of induction. It's the basis behind all inductive reasoning. Roughly the idea is that uh, the, the events in the future will resemble the events in the past. So I throw it up in the air, it comes back down. I throw it up in the air, it comes back down. That's what it has happened in the past. And so I infer that in the future, I'm going to throw it one more time, and in the future it's going to come back down. There it is. That's called the principle of induction. And Hume wonders whether this principle of induction is in fact justified. Is this justified? Well, how would it be justified? Remember, we got two kinds of objects of knowledge. We got, uh, we got relations of ideas using demonstrative reasoning, and we've got matters of fact using observation. Well, let's consider the first one. If this principle of induction is justified, then either it's going to be justified using demonstrative reasoning or it's going to be justified using moral reasoning. Well, what about demonstrative reasoning? Can we prove the principle of induction using demonstrative reasoning? Well, what's the principle? The principle is the events in the past, excuse me, the events in the future will resemble the events in the past. All right. Now, for something to be the product of demonstrative reasoning, the conclusion can't be false. Right? The conclusion can't be false. So I, you know, okay, well it can't be false. It goes up, it comes down. It goes up, it comes down. It goes up. It didn't come down that time. If you know, the statement, the events in the future will not necessarily resemble the events in the past? It's not a contradiction. Right? Future just means things that will happen. Past just means things that did happen. There's nothing about things that will happen that implies that they must happen as they've always happened. That's not a self-contradiction. So, the principle of induction, the denial of the principle of induction is not a self-contradiction. So, given what we said so far, it can't be proven using deductive reasoning. Or, I'm sorry, demonstrative reasoning. It's not the product of a relation of ideas. If we're a product of the relation of ideas, then saying that the future uh, does not resemble the past would be a self-contradiction. It doesn't do that. So, if there's going to be a proof for deductive reasoning, then either it's going to be through demon excuse me, if there's going to be proof for the principle of induction, then it's either going to be using demonstrative reasoning or moral reasoning. Well, we just looked at demonstrative reasoning, it can't do it. Well, what about moral reasoning? Can moral reasoning prove the principle of induction? Well, what would that be like? Well, remember using moral reasoning, we have to use matters of fact. And using matter of fact, we make observations. All right. Using matter of fact, matters of fact, we make observations. Okay. Do we observe the principle of induction? Well, let's worry about the, that conundrum. Let's suppose we can observe the principle of induction. We see the principle of induction somehow. Uh, in order for us to use moral reasoning to uh, prove the principle of induction, we have to say that. Uh, the principle of deduction has always worked, and therefore it will work in the future. Right? So, uh, hey, well, let's look at let's look at the physical sciences. We use the principle of deduction there all the time, and uh, every time, well, you know, most of the time, anyway, you know, enough times where we know enough of what we're doing. When we use the principle of induction, 
uh, we make these great predictions and the predictions come true. That's great, right? That's really great. We're able to take the sciences and make true predictions very consistently. That's fantastic. So we conclude that uh, the principle of induction will work in the future. Well, you see what's going on there? If we prove the principle of induction using moral reasoning, we have to argue that since it's worked in the past, it will work in the future. But claiming that since it worked in the past, it will work in the future just is the principle of induction. So if we use the principle of induction for moral reasoning to prove the principle of induction, we have to assume that the principle of induction is already true. But assuming it's already true, that's not a proof for the principle of induction. That's just assuming it's true. So we can't prove the principle of induction using moral reasoning. Well, if we can't, so, you know, since we can't prove it using demonstrative reasoning, and we can't prove it using moral reasoning, and those are only two ways to reason, we can't prove the principle of induction. Well, then that means that all of our matters of fact are simply related to observations, and we don't observe a whole lot. We make a whole lot of claims besides what we observe. That limits our knowledge a great deal. So, we have this little problem with Hume here. He says, you know, if our, uh, if uh, 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 the principle of induction is justified, then we only got two choices, either using demonstrative reasoning or using moral reasoning. Demonstrative reasoning can't do it because the denial of the principle of induction is not a self-contradiction. The uh, moral reasoning is not going to do it because any proof using the moral reasoning uh, relies on, depends upon, assumes the truth of the principle of induction. He can't prove the principle of deduction by assuming it's true. So we ask him, why is it that we have this uh, induction all the time? Why is it that we reason using the principle of induction all the time? And, you know, by the way, why is it that it works all the time? Well, um, Hume's not going to deny it works. So yeah, sure. You know, go ahead. Use it. I mean, it's, it's working. You know, why not? However, that doesn't mean we're justified. That doesn't mean we have knowledge. Well, we ask, well, why is it that we have this principle of induction? Human says it's a matter of custom. Right? Uh, it's a matter of custom. We, uh, our brains are wired to uh, use the principle of induction all the time. And, you know, we could even point to an evolutionary advantage to using uh, the principle of induction. If we, you know, observe ten times in a row that a uh, tiger is going to eat you, well then, uh, using the principle of induction, justified or not, you will accurately predict that in the future that tiger will try to eat you, so you stay away from tigers. Right? Um, but it doesn't mean it's justified. So, uh, so we have this uh, principle of induction. It's, it's using custom. We say, so what? Why isn't it justified using custom? Well, you know, there's lots of ways that our brains are wired that don't produce. No, brains are wired for reason that don't produce true results. You know, the gambler's fallacy is one was one case. Uh, an instance of the gambler's fallacy is something like this. So I, I take a quarter, and um, it's a fair quarter, meaning it's equal weighted on both sides, and I flip it in the air once. And I ask, what's the probability of it coming up heads? And you say, well, 50-50, right? 50% 50 chance, and that's right, because it's a fair quarter. You flip it, come back, it comes up heads. That's a 50-50. Well, suppose I take that same quarter, and I flip it 10 times in a row. Now, the probability of coming up heads is 50%, is and the probability of coming up tails is 50%, and I flip it 10 times in a row, and all 10 times it comes up heads. So I ask you, what's the probability of it coming up tails when I toss it in the air the 11th time? Now most people are really tempted to say higher than 50% because they say, look, it, it, it came up uh, heads all those other times. It came up heads all those other times. So the next time it's gotta be tails. No, that's the gambler's fallacy. <coughs> The gambler's fallacy presumes that 
uh, events are going to affect other events even though they're causally unrelated. So our brains do this all the time and uh, <laughs> you know there's an entire city that takes advantage of the fact that we're not really good at reasoning using probabilities. Uh, you know what happens there stays there, right? <laughs> um, but uh, uh, that's the way that our brain reasons. I mean our brain also is wired to form stereotypes. But that's not a good way to reason. Uh, our brain is wired to um, I don't know, our brain is wired to tell us that all this stuff around us is solid. Right? There's, there's, uh, you know, it's got all these trees have edges, and between the edges there's no empty space. But contemporary physics tells us that these trees are full of empty space as well as you are too. So, you know, simply because our brain is wired to think in a particular way doesn't mean it's justified because there's plenty of ways that our, that our brains are not wired, to, that, do not, that are wired that don't reason well. So at the end of the day, when we're talking to Hume about what justifies the principle of inductive reason, uh, the principle of induction, you know, Hume's going to say you either got demonstrative or moral. Demonstrative can't do it. Moral presumes it. You've got nothing. So, Hume says, all of your moral reasoning, all the conclusions using moral reasoning, you know, a lot of it might be true. Doesn't mean it's justified. And if it's not justified, you don't know it.